Hello everyone, this is Colin once again, and coming back with another video reviewing. Uh, I tried to review the debate between Muhammad Hijab and Apostate Prophet uh, during a live stream, and not only did I have technical difficulties throughout the whole thing, but it also ended up, uh, well anyway, that is no more. But um, I wanted to come back with this video because while I was babbling for a few hours to a live audience, uh, about the subject of my review, I realized that what came out of that babble were pretty distinct points that I wanted to make. Uh, and so the points I'm going to be talking about in this video, I'm hoping to be pretty brief here. Um, if you go to the more info section down below, I'm going to put some links to various uh, articles that I think will help um, demonstrate what I'm trying to say here. I want to be very clear that in the outset of this video, um, I did not myself go into watching, or excuse me, I first listened to the debate between Apostate Prophet and Muhammad Hijab, the two-hour debate, when it was originally broadcasted on Spotify on um, the Adam, uh, Adam Saleh's um, podcast with Slim. <clears throat> and I have never listened to this podcast before. I, I knew that a video was coming, but I wanted to... As soon as I discovered it was on Spotify, I decided to listen to it, and I started taking notes. Um, and I went into it not really knowing what to expect, because like many of you, I'm sure you all were knew that this event had happened, and that the respective parties had recordings of the uh, events, and that they were going to upload them to YouTube um, and Spotify and their respective domains. Uh, so I went into it thinking this is going to be like a proper debate. Right. Come to find out that the standards were less than uh, what was expected. Uh, so I went into it not actually. Uh, I mean, uh, I'll be upfront with my biases. I lean more uh, towards apostate prophet's position in this regard than I certainly do with Muhammad Hijab. But that's if we had swiped uh, out Muhammad Hijab for somebody else, a different Muslim apologist or scholar, I, I, pro I you know probably would have been a better debate, perhaps. Um, but I, I genuinely, because I used to be a Muslim apolog apologist, I used to be very polemical in, uh, in my previous videos, previous, uh, it was a lifetime ago. Um, and I, you know, I participated in pretty intense in my own time, in my prime, in pretty intense online debates with people who uh, identified from various traditions, atheism, Christianity, and people actually were willing to hear and I was willing to listen and hear, and that was the gist of the conversations. So I went into it kind of expecting that, and, and assuming that Apostate Prophet would probably do a, a good job, but also knowing what Muhammad Hijab's supposed qualifications are, and knowing that he's actually been... Um, I've seen the debate between him and David Wood, etc. So I, I went into it thinking, oh good, they've had a debate. Well... I listened to the debate, right, <laughs> and took some notes, like I said, and come to find out that there were a few points uh, that I want to mention here that I think shows the, um, you know, the weakness of the presentation given by Muhammad Hijab. And I know that other people have reviewed this debate. I know that people have already been making points. I know that as of right now, the recording of this video, Apostate Prophet has uploaded two additional videos on the subject of Muhammad Hijab, and I know that David Wood has done the same. So what could I offer? Well, I tried to offer this to my live stream audience last night, but I want to offer it now to all of you in a, in a concise video. Point number one, Muhammad Hijab's credentials. If you'll turn to the more info section of this video, you'll see a link to the Sapiens Institute. This link is very, very important because this shows, as far as I can tell, what Muhammad Hijab's qualifications are. His qualifications are stated, and I will not be quoting the website verbatim, but he has a bachelor's degree in political science, he has a master's degree in history, he has a master's degree in Islamic studies, and he has done some form of some sort of training at a Islamic seminary in the areas of fiqh, Arabic, Quran, etc. Nowhere in Muhammad Hijab's at least public profile of his credentials is it ever made clear that this 
individual has a degree, certificate, or anything of the kind in philosophy. In the debate, he says that he did a degree in political philosophy. Now, I don't believe that's probably true. What I believe is what I know, because unlike Muhammad Hijab, um, uh, I not only have a bachelor's degree, I have two master's degrees, and I also have two certificates um, that were post post grad doc, uh, docs uh, or um, certif certifications. Now. Uh, I'm feeling like Reza Aslan in that one uh, old video where he's being very condescending to the newscaster saying, well, I have a PhD. And see, I also would invite people who are watching this video to check out the essay by William James entitled The PhD Octopus to see why we should be skeptical of anyone with any academic credential and to also not make the mistake of committing the fallacy of um, truth by authority which is something routinely committed by Muhammad Hijab during this so-called debate. So why do I mention my own degrees? Well, because I can almost guarantee that I have spent more years studying Islam and comparative religion as a layman, former Muslim, apologist, defender online, and then apostate, and then grad student. Okay. Unlike Muhammad Hijab, I actually have a degree in theological studies. I have a degree uh, in things that are quite relevant to this discussion. But let's go back to philosophy for a moment. So that's the first point I wanted to make is that I, I as an academic myself, I am not impressed by so far what I'm seeing from Muhammad Hijab as someone who's aspiring to be an academic or a professional uh, debate person, okay? Uh, and if we're going to be throwing around degrees like that really matters, because I actually don't think it really matters at the end of the day how many pieces of paper I have framed and on my wall, um, but I want to put that out there that we can be, and anyone can play this game. That's the first thing. Now let's talk about his use of argumentation. Well, he, as I said just now, he's committed multiple times in that debate. He committed the fallacy over and over again of uh, truth by authority, right? Citing authorities to prove your point. He not only cited tons of dead people and uh, also did a terrible job of representing these positions of which he invoked, but cited himself as a person of authority, which really isn't done. I mean, you don't really advertise your own books unless you're trying to sell it, which I guarantee you in this case, that's what he was doing because he mentioned his books during the debate or the podcast about six times. Um, you really only do that if you are at a book event, you know, uh, you don't, and never, it's really bad form to say, well, I've written books on this. So what have you done? That's not how you engage people in a debate. That's also not how you educate people. And if Muhammad Hijab's uh, vision was that he was the teacher schooling the student, you can just look at Apostate Prophet's reactions to this ambush to know, the cyber ambush to know, that he was not schooled effectively. He left thinking to himself, Muhammad Hijab is a terrible teacher. And I would agree with him on that point. Now, Another huge blunder in terms of a person who's pretending to be a philosophy academic, and I actually know some of those in my personal life and academic life, so I know people who know philosophy, and trust me, I haven't done it yet, but if I sent the link to the podcast to some of my philosophy professor friends, they would wipe the floor with Muhammad Hijab. This I will promise you. Wipe the floor. But let me, let me, if you, if if I may, let me just provide a sample of what I mean. If you look at the more info section, you will now see a link to a philosophy article written by academics that is a survey of just a sample of popular historic moral theories. Why do I mention this? Because Muhammad Hijab, the so-called professor of philosophy, told the apostate prophet and seemed to be shocked when the apostate prophet didn't play go fish with this 
that there are only two types of moral philosophy. You either have to be subjective or objective. False. False. Falsity. Outright lie. So that's the second point. So already, credentials. <laughs> okay. Uh, argumentation. You, you know, presenting yourself as being qualified and then trying to school someone on it and realizing that you... <laughs> second point. Third point, the use of material. He goes all... Muhammad Hijab did a brilliant thing, I have to confess, but you have to be paying attention to see his magic here. Um, he produced... He made a straw man and gifted it to apostate prophet during the debate. He defaulted on... He invokes utilitarianism, even though apostate prophet, as far as I could tell, and other reviewers have confirmed this for me, he never... Apostate prophet never mentions utilitarianism. Um, this is also about as bizarre as Muhammad Hijab talking to apostate prophet about the Bible. Apostate prophet is an apostate from Islam, not from Christianity. So if you're going to bring up the Bible, regardless of apostate prophet is friends with David Wood, who's a Christian, that's called a red herring and a straw man. In an academic debate, a debate coach would, would, would hit a buzzer and go, you have lost the debate. All right. Because you've gone off course and you've brought up BS to try to save yourself. What's the straw man that he created, you might ask? Utilitarianism as a point of weird argumentation between him and Apostate Prophet. Uh, and and challenging Apostate Prophet to factoid, just like he was. Drop some facts, rando facts. Say you've read a book by a dead person. Okay, I can do that too. Here, I have a book here. 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 Here, here's another book. This one's from a dead person, William James. Yeah, okay, I can rattle off names and titles all day long, and then I can say, Oh, can you do that? You're a punk. All right. Another thing in the more info section is a Muslim heritage website to Ibn Hazm. Now, why do I mention this? Because he trotted out Ibn Hazm and Ibn Taymiyyah as if they thought the earth was round, as opposed to many scholars in Islam's history who have said that the Quran implies the earth is flat, which has been pointing out by which has been pointed out by other reviewers of this debate. Why am I bringing up is because I actually know a thing or two about Ibn Hazm. If you've watched any of my videos, you'll know that at some point, at one point in my journey, I was reading into and considered myself for even if it was just for a year right a adherent to the zahiri school fic guess which scholar i had to become familiar with ibn hazm and i did read his fic uh, as best as i could uh, there's not a full english translation of his masterpiece in arab that's originally written in arabic but I have I found my way through through life finding scraps of knowledge and bringing it all together. I found translations of whole chunks of his assessment on hadiths and fiqh. All right, so in his in the Sahiri methodology. Uh, so I'm familiar with this. So I chuckled when I heard Ibn Hazm's name being invoked. And the reason why I mention it is if you look at this article, uh, Ibn Hazm was invoked to be a scientist. Well, unlike Muhammad Hijab, Ibn Hazm from the grave shows more, shows more honesty and integrity as a apologist or scholar of Islam, which Muhammad Hijab is not either of those things, effectively. Ibn Hazm clearly states in this document that there is a there's a stopping of Islamic knowledge. In other words, he confesses, if you scroll down to astronomy section, he says that Muslim knowledge is at its, when it comes to the tr like the nature of astronomy, you can read it for yourself, he basically says, we really don't know. We've, we're at the brink of what we can know about like how old the world is, or the globe, or plant, you know, this, this reality we're in. How old is it? Has it gone through how many ages? And Ibn Hazm says, I don't know. We don't know. The people of this group, this community, my community does not know about this. And yet other people, other non-Muslims meaning, have suggested this concept of like successive ages. 
So he, Ibn Hazm is admitting in this context that Muslim, or at his time, Muslim scholarship had reached as far as it could go. And what does he do? He relies on the science of non-Muslims who have come before him, or it might be his contemporaries, depending on who he's talking about. Why do I bring this up? Because Muhammad Hijab, early on in the debate, dismisses science. He calls science something as like an enterprise. He says it's probably an enterprise that you shouldn't really be involved in because of the misunderstanding that people have about the scientific method around the world, right? His scholars, though, and he demonstrates this by invoking the concept of like Islamic scholarship and tafsir and interpretation and Ibn Hazm. What do these all these things have in common? They're building on a science, on a discipline where you it doesn't just stop and end with the name of the person who invented or maybe published first on a particular philosophy, which is why it is a ridiculous debate tactic to talk about the fact that you've read John Stuart Mill. Who cares? All right? Like, really, not only do modern utilitarians maybe don't even read much of John Stuart Mill anymore. So by you saying you've read him and making fun of apostate prophet for not, even though you cut him off so many times we couldn't even understand whether he had read it or not, that... You not only dismiss the idea of building knowledge, which is science, building knowledge, stacking it from one scholar to another ad nauseum for, till the end of doomsday, instead of just saying, oh, well, you know, a couple dead people said this, so there. You're not only being lazy with your scholarship, but you're not actually doing what academics do, which is you read the primary material and then you go, what's the state of the question right now? That's what academics ask all the time. What is the state of the question right now? Like if I might ask, what's the state of current Muslim apologetics right now? I could cite better Muslim apologists than Muhammad Hijab and say, that's the only thing we need to know about Muslim apologetics and its history. And then a lot of people who are big Ahmed Didat fans or Zakir Naik fans Sorry if you still are. And other apologists would go, whoa, how come you're not talking about these people who are alive? Well, according to Muhammad Hijab's logic, why should I care? If I can cite some dead people, who cares? Who cares? But that's just lazy attempts at being an academic, frankly. So he refuses to give science a buildup, quotes dead end science uh, statements made by scholars without asking the question of what is the current situation on any of these things. So you can see that his debate style leaves much to be desired, and I'm shocked that he couldn't do better than this considering that he had two hosts playing referee or like guarding him and, and interrupting apostate prophet left and right. Uh, as, a, as was pointed out by an early review of the debate by another uh, ex-Muslim, uh, it was pointed out that uh, he was told he could talk, Apostate Prophet was told that he could talk for 10 minutes, I think, or two minutes or something like that, and Muhammad Hijab or Adam or Slim essentially cut him off in like 10 seconds. Yeah, this was a debate. <laughs> Muhammad Hijab, do not put this on your CV. Please don't. Don't do it. Because if any future academic employers find out that you performed this badly in front of God and everybody, I would not be proud of this, my friend. And you, this is your final fallacy, my friend. This is the final critique I have for you and your performance. You also did something which any true academic, hey, why don't you ask James White for some advice before challenging him to a debate? Because seriously, if you couldn't even hold to debate standards in this ambush, James White would tear you apart. And trust me, Adam Rashid, or Adnan Rashid, excuse me, your colleague at this current institute that you're at, knows what it's like to get spanked by James White. Please ask him about it. And I know what it was like for Adnan Rashid to get his butt spanked by James White in their last debate. So, you talk a big talk. You you uh, you you are actually a big guy, right? Like about you know you are. That's about all you have going for you. 
as far as I can tell. You're you're physically you have a physical presence and you like to have people around you. You like you you said you won't do an online debate because you like having an audience. So you like being on the Jerry Springer show because so far your material reminds me. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Uh, it was this successful show over here in this glorious part of the world where uh, it, was, it was just a, it was just fake. It was just a complete circus, right? That is the type of discourse I'm seeing here. When I used to do my stuff, the level of discourse was up here. Muhammad Hijab has done us a great disservice by dropping that bar off my screen. All right? He's dropped it. Whoops! There it goes, integrity. Whoops! There it goes, trying to actually be an authentic academic. Whoops! There it goes. Uh, so, does this mean that I think apostate prophet is an expert? No. Does it mean that apostate prophet won this debate? No. What apostate prophet did is he fended off three bullies, two fools, and a guest that they used to ambush under false pretenses. That is the type of behavior. And why I mentioned James White? Well, because what you're supposed to do after a supposed debate is instead of going home and going, I kicked that guy's butt. I'm the best apologist ever. You're supposed to let the audience decide for themselves. Not encouraging your followers to harass, not encouraging your followers to make propaganda versions of your debate by either messing with the audio or only getting 10 minutes and then going, he, 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 he. That is not how you conduct yourself, Muhammad Hijab. Well, a lot of points were made during this debate. I look forward to seeing what's going to happen next. Um, probably will try to do some more live streams at some point, more, make more videos talking about why I left Islam because I can't even give a nutshell version. And, uh, for those of you who saw my live stream on apostasy day, you will notice that it is no longer on my channel. I did not delete it. I have it. It is saved. I am, uh, it's archived for right now. I will probably make it public again once I start doing more of a series of, videos just maybe picking one verse literally like why i'm no longer part of islam what led me out of sunni islam etc um i will go into detail in a series of videos that i'll be doing which will probably be a combination of um live streams but more intentional videos like this so thank you all for watching and taking the time i'll leave you here with this thought uh, i will be putting those links in the description section for all of you to have a look um, and as I always say, continue to educate yourselves. Don't trust every supposed academic you meet. Always be skeptical. Keep learning. Keep illuminating yourselves. And peace be with you all.